Hey, hello uh, and welcome to Ruskin Asks, the new project being launched this summer by the Ruskin Geography Department and the Eco Committee. Each week during the summer holidays we will be speaking to one guest who works in the environmental sector. This week we're incredibly lucky to have two for the price of one. Um, so we're kicking off speaking to the Black Mambas. Uh, we have Valeria and Leita joining us from the Black Mambas organisation. They're based in South Africa in the Greater Kruger area. Um, and the Black Mambas is one of the world's first all-female anti-poaching units. Um, during our conversation, we're going to hope to find out a little bit about the environmental issues they're working in, uh, their journeys, their stories, how they got into working in the sector, um, and hopefully a few practical hints and bits of advice for any of you out there that are looking for either a career in the environment or you know, general career options in the future as well. Um, so, we'll start off, I think, by finding out a little bit more about you guys. I've very briefly gone into the idea that you are the, one, well, if not the first, then one of the first all-female anti-poaching units. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your organisation, what it is you do, sort of how you go about achieving your aims? Okay, shall, shall we start? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, my name is Leita, I'm Karela. So the Black Members Project started in 2014, where um, a smaller landscape in Balule was attacked by poachers where they were killing rhinos. And then uh, Craig Spencer, the founder of the Black Members, uh, saw an opportunity to use women to patrol the, the boundaries of Balule to protect their wild animals. Since uh, long then, we used to have uh, male people who were doing a uh, field render and it was believed that women cannot do this job, it's for men, as the job is very much difficult and it's too much risky and all sort of things. So in 2014, where uh, six ladies uh, came to Bermuda for an interview and they passed and then they started with this, it was all about creating an awareness and um, giving uh, back to the community women empowerment so that women can stand up for themselves and do something. As uh, in our communities, we used to have so many women who were just staying at home, they can't do all the jobs because some of the jobs will be said that it's for men and sometimes those women don't have qualifications to work in the offices and other jobs. So this was an opportunity for most of us. The six ladies started in Balule and they were doing great, but then Balule is about 62,000 uh, 62, hectares, which was bigger for six people to patrol. In 2013, that's when I joined, we were 20, and then we came and did the interview. So I heard about this too from um, a lady that I went to school with, and then she became a black mama in 2014. So when Craig said he wanted to expand the project, he told me that uh, they need people because we were doing uh, Eco Club at school. So Eco Club was uh, hosted by the Dimbabati Foundation, where they go to the community and partnership with the schools, and then they teach us about the environment, how to protect the wild animals and also to protect uh, the environment in whole, the, the, uh, the domestic animals that we're having in the community. And then that's where we also learn about being independent and starting our, um, our own uh, gardening, where we plant uh, tomatoes, onions, spinach, and we give it to poor people in the community and also sell it to people so that the women can grow up knowing that if I'm not working, uh, I have to start my own business and provide for myself. So since then, I went to the Dimbabati Foundation when I was in grade 10, grade 11, and grade 12. So I learned about animals and uh, the environment, how to protect wildlife, how to protect water, and all sort of things. So that's when I had this small knowledge about the bush and about animals. And then I heard about poaching. To my head, it was like uh, they were just coming with a gun that doesn't use a bullet and then they will shoot uh, the rhino but the injection will go in and then it will just leap and then they cut the horn it will grow again but then that was not the truth people are coming with uh, big weapons with bullets that they they kill the rhino and remove uh, the horn sometimes you find that the rhino is not dead it's nothing to them it doesn't mean anything they will just cut it alive 
and leave it like that. Sometimes it will survive, but the wound is too much. So from there, when I heard about this job, I was like, okay, uh, since I can't go to varsity because my parents doesn't have enough money to take me to school, since my sister is also in varsity, let me try my luck with this. And I've got a small knowledge. And I went and did an interview, then I passed, and then I came back for the training. The community were like, no, girls, you can't do this. This is for me. Even my mom and my dad were like, no, no you can't do this. The animals are going to kill you. The lions, how are you going to survive in the bush where, where the elephants are going to kill you? Yes, and I was like, I, I'm going there. I want to do something. I want to try something. Uh, by that time, I was having uh, a baby boy who was only nine months old. And then I had to leave him with my mom. And then I came to work. So I knew he was in good hands. And then I started to do my training, which took uh, about three months to finish. It was a difficult training that I've ever been in my life. And if they can tell me now that I need to go back to that training, ah, <laughs> 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 it was <Don't> so <laughs> You know, I used, yeah, really yeah, I used to yeah. see it on TV when I saw soldiers being trained like that. Men were crying in training, and now it's me. I have to do it. How can I do this? You know, it was difficult. But then we did a training with um, the I, I was in the first training, the first ten girls. The second ten came after when when we came out, they went for the training. So. Oh God, it was, it's not even easy to speak about this. The training was bad. It was hard. But then the training was good because that's where we got skills to use. Like we've been here for six, for six years now. And none of us has been injured or killed by animals or killed by poachers. We all survived. This is all through the training. So we were sleeping in the bush. We would cut the knob thorns and make a boma. And then inside, we just uh, cut uh, branches and make a small, smaller bomber inside. But when it rains, you would get wet. We were not sleeping there. Uh, every two hours, one of us need to wake up and guard so that we all sleep. Because the lions were coming, but I couldn't come inside because we used, we used the knock thoughts. The, the, the elephants would come, but they couldn't come in. So it was, you know, it was a big oh, wow. experience in my life. Yeah, it was a big experience in my life. I was like, Am I living in the bush? There's no house, there's nothing. Snakes inside the goma, you know. Yeah, but it was exciting. We were there and we were, we were uplifting each other. You know, when it's when it gets difficult, we would cry and we would motivate each other like we have to do this. You know, you are here because you know you, you have a reason why you're here. So we need to do this. If not us, nobody is going to do it. If we if we quit now, the other 10 girls that are walking the fence line, they're also going to run away because they will be like, why did we quit? Then it means it's hard, it's hard. they're not going to do it also. So it was so difficult. Around 4 a.m., you have to wake up and cook and finish your cooking, eat, and make sure that the, the ashes disappear. If somebody can come, they must find that this place, they, they must think that there was nobody at that area. And then after you wash your pot and you hide it, you walk and you clean your, your, your tracks, you know, it was like, oh my God, what is this? But it was just something else, you know, it was just, it was just something you need. And then we would go out from 6 a.m. and then we come back 6 p.m. You're not eating anything. You're just drinking water. Water would get finished around 1 or 2 p.m. And then you go, you have to ask from a friend, and that's where we learned that a sip of water is enough. And then you continue because they still, you know, you're still having a long day ahead. And then we would beg up each other. Other girls would suffocate, and they want to faint. We'd help each other, learning how to track, learning how the animals' behavior, how to approach a poacher, and you know all the different things. So 6 p.m. you're back at the camp. You have to cook. You don't bath. You only brush your teeth. Remember, we are ladies, and this was the first time. The training was hard. The menstruation would just come anytime. You don't bath. You just put the pads, remove it. You put it and remove it. It was like, oh, my God, we're not stinking. It was bad. 
And our sergeant will be like, you have to think like an animal. You have to think like an animal. <laughs> when he's shining from the and he will tell you to go to the mud or to go to a place where the, the salt storm, and you have to roll down so that you can get dirty. So then we came up with a plan. What can you do now? Because we're thinking, when the sultan sleep around 12 midnight, we can just wake up and do the charge up of the parts that are... And then we do that, but one day he found us, oh, and the punishment was too much. Push-ups and all those, you, you know, you're telling us, you said you want 50-50 and here it is. Now you've got it. So it was, we felt like, why is this guy treating us like this? But the last day, we all ran and hug him. You know, you were the best dad, all those nice ways. You teach us to be, you know, we just came from community, we're just little girls, we didn't know anything. And then you opened the bush and you told us to read it like a newspaper. And then you, you change us, we are now women. Mm -hmm. And after the training, so many of us had lost our weight. I remember oh, Craig. Craig. Yes, Craig. <laughs> Craig didn't want to see us because the training was hard. He knew that he, no, he can't see us. And we also, we also couldn't control it. And when we go to the compounds to go and learn about the firearm and, and uh, like different things that we have to learn in the classroom, the other girls, they saw us and we were all crying because, mm. you know, like, really? Is it you? Are we also going to suffer like this? <laughs> and Craig said, yeah, no, this together. one must be, this two group must be anymore because now it's too much emotional. And then from there, we went back and trained and we finished the training and it was nice. We were now singing, dancing, we got our certificate and now we are professional black members. And then we were motivating the others. You know what, girls? You need to be strong. You let me know. I'm holding my certificate. Mm -hmm. If you go there and do it for two days and you quit, then you're not fit. Then you can't have this. And it means that I will be better than you. So you guys need to keep it up. And we were motivating them. And then we went home. And then the community is like, oh my God, is this you? I remember the first time my mom laid her eyes on me. She cried. I was like, really? Is this you? You were not like this when you go. You lost weight. What was happening? And then I started to tell them the stories, whatever happened. And then they saw that there is a difference mm. from the did lady they, that I was. Did uh, they change their opinion then? They weren't very keen on you starting. What were they doing when you done it? Yes, they did change. And they were like, you know, now the way you're talking, has, the way you talk has changed. The way you walk, the way you do things, you know. You, you, you grow yeah. and then we came back again after four days of resting and then we started to work i remember we we were not uh, we, we got our uniform but the first time through the three months of, of training we didn't have uniform and we would use our own shoes to walk you know baluri road there are there are so many uh roads yeah. and, you know it destroys so many flat shoes of us yeah. but we said we're gonna continue doing this until somebody see that we really want to do this and we really want to wear and after that we got the uniform so we went to our training with a uniform and food yeah. food. somebody donated so which was good and we started working and we were working it was so difficult it was very it, you know it's very much hard to decide hard. and then we would go out from in the morning to sweep we would go out to patrol the the, the, the fence so many snares and then we would come back with 70 snares mm -hmm. And so many things, so many suspicious things that was happening, so many activities. We destroy our uh, poachers camps, we destroy bushmeat poaching, we remove all this mess, show people that we're here, we're in business. And you know what? People uh, stopped, people started to realize that there are people who are patrolling here and they stopped on coming in and in different groups putting us uh, nets. And then the community also saw that, wow, these people are doing something good. And then we are on TV, we are on newspaper, so many people are talking about us and then everybody started to like what we're doing. So many women were interested, you know. I remember that time <clears throat> when I go home, people would ask me, when are they going to, to, to be posts where they want people to work? Because we really want to do what you're doing. 
then we, we realize that wow, we are not the role models in the community. Yeah. When we go to schools, as uh, the black members got the Bush Baby Project, when we go to schools to teach kids about what we're doing, where we started, where we are now, what is our goal, what we have removed, the all those sort of things, we became the role models to the kids. So from where we started, it was so difficult, but because we wanted to do this and we know what we wanted to do, most of the black members are doesn't have parents, they're breadwinners. And then some of the parents, but still breadwinners, mm -hmm. because you know in South Africa there's a problem of unemployment rate. So mm -hmm. that's where we, we, we were motivating each other more that we need to do this for, for our families. You know, if you quit today, who's gonna bring food in the table? And then the exciting part is that uh, we started to, to grow a bond with with animals. Animals are not our friends, they all know us, but then we started to grow bond with them. We started to know why why we have to, to protect them. We started to know why we have to protect the environment because for the for the next generation, for our kids, they need to get work here. Mm -hmm. And um, since we are struggling with 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 uh, with with, work, with jobs in South Africa, I have realized that in tourism, in tourism, there are so many careers that people can do. There's so many things that people can do, and then we continue living like that because we are struggling with this rhino coaching because so many people are not working mm -hmm. and they're sitting at home not doing anything. And then they were like, "Okay, let me go into the reserve, kill a good snail, and I will get bush meat and I will sell to to the community. Let me go and kill a rhino. I will get uh, quick money, mm -hmm. and then I will be able to have a nice house, a nice car." where I will be able to provide for my family, take my kids to, to private schools, and then they can have a bright future. Mm -hmm. so, so we've been learning. We've been learning every day. We're learning different things. Every day we're learning why people are coaching. Every day we're learning why we should do this, why we should continue uh, building partnership with the community, why we should uh, bring the community closer. There are so many people in the community, like all the people who are serving Four years. They've never seen a rhino, but they're just 11 kilometers away from themselves. They've never seen an elephant because they don't even have cars to drive in the main road just to pass by. Then they can see an elephant from inside. So that's where we've got uh, the, the bush greenies. So those greenies in holidays or whenever time when they are, when, when, when we've got space, we bring them inside the reserve so that they can see the rhinos, so that they can see the elephant. And they go home and tell their sons whom are the uncles or our fathers or you know those people who, who come and kill the rhinos our brothers and everyone so they, they tell them about the experience that they've gained in the reserve you know like seeing an elephant drinking water mm -hmm. seeing an elephant putting water on top of itself because it's hot seeing an elephant uh, uh, like scrolling in the mud you know it's a great experience from them and then when they take it home people started to see, wow, this is beautiful. Because they don't get a chance to come in here. They don't know that this thing needs to be loved. They don't know that an animal, you can bond with it, you can fall in love with it. So they feel, even when they kill it, when the animal cry, they're like, ah, it's just an animal. Mm -hmm. But ever since they come inside and experience this, so many things change, is changing in the community. So it brings us back to where um, education is the... Is the, is the biggest thing to fight uh, rhino poaching or to fight uh, bushmeat poaching because people don't have knowledge and then they don't know. But when they get knowledge, they start to know why I should protect the wild animals. Now, we we, 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 we are stuck with this corona. People are sitting at home, they don't do anything and it's not easy for everybody. They can't uh, provide for their families and we are lucky because we're still working. Yeah, we can still provide yeah. for our families. Each so, single, each so, single member in our company, including mm -hmm. the black mamas and including the bush babies, none of them has lost a job. Yeah, That's and, and the, the rangers, yeah, the food rangers, uh, the trackers, so many people that are working in the in the lodges, all of them went home, and yeah. so many of them are losing their jobs. So this is bringing us back to where we have to. Work hard. There's nobody inside the reserve. It's only the black members that are patrolling. Mm -hmm. And now it is very much difficult for us because when uh, when the rangers and uh, I mean the mm -hmm. film, the film guys that the trackers are here, they help us with eyes and ears. Mm -hmm. Of course. Now it's only us. And then with them at home, 
sometimes you can find that they go to the bottle store, they just want to drink and mm -hmm. end up giving more information. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're giving it because they want to sell information. They're just getting drunk. They don't know what to talk about. Oh, they're not so working. They're not enjoying anything. And then they end up saying, ah, oh, but you remember there when we were doing that game drive and we saw a rhino at this sport and yeah, that rhino is always there. Somebody's listening. And somebody will pass by Barule driving on the main road. Oh, this is Barule. And then they say that spot where Rhino always is, this side. And then those people will come in a porch because people are now at home. They're not making. They can't provide for their families. So, you know, we're all struggling. And then that's where us as the black members, we have to start to work hard. Keep monitoring all the sites that there's nobody coming in and out of the reserve. So we are doing our patrols. It, it, you know, it changes. We change our routine through the the seasons. Now it's winter. Around six, half past six and six is still dark, and we in the morning we walk. So for our safety, we start at seven o'clock, and then we patrol the boundaries, make sure that we pick up every suspicious thing that we found. The cutting of fence, the digging of walls. Animals also dig walls, like wattles. They dig walls and they want to go to the opposite reserve. And when the poachers come, they say, oh, why do I have to deal with the fence that has electricity? I can just use this wall to go inside the reserve. It's easier. So we took those kind of walls with rocks and branches. And then we also uh, do our sweep where we go inside the bush and sweep for snake. Because it might happen that poachers escape and they use those holes and then we close the holes but the coaches are still inside so we, when we've got full team like now there, are, there is a team that goes inside the bush to sweep and there is a team that is on the fence line patrolling and then we do our night shift so on night shift we use cars because it's not safe with the animals to walk at night so we are driving around uh shining our spotlight talking in the walkie-talkie, and then we've got uh, a small ops room where we monitor where the members are and whatever um, information they found, they will send it in the ops room. So we know at this point they found this and all sort of things. So we, we, we gather information, we do visual police and um, patrol the boundaries of Banula doing roadblocks to search every car that are coming in and out of the reserve, making sure that nobody come in with uh, like a legal firearm or weapons or anything that can harm our animals or come to steal in the lodges. And also search everybody who's going out because a person can come in and go out with a, a dead impala, which is not right. So we search all the cars. So basically that is done to, to in a way prevent um, wildlife trafficking because besides mm -hmm. the weapons and everything, also people can take they can poach the rhino and take the horn. Mm -hmm. They can take a funny pangolin and also put it in the back and uh, take it with. So that is extremely important. Well, I mean, thank you so much. What an amazing story. Um, I've had so many teachers and students say what an inspiration your work is. Um, and I've just got so many questions, it's difficult to know where to start. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, if we go back to sort of where it started, was it whilst you were in school that your sort of your desire to work in this sector started? Yeah, so uh, when I that's where I started to to join the eco club, and that's when I started to learn about the coach, and I felt like, wow, it's nice to be in the in, in holiday, out of school, out of the community. Mm -hmm. So you, you had an eco club at your school? You had an eco club at the school? Yes, yes. We still have it even now. So it, it um. continues. We still have it even now. So it helps because um, so many people or, or so many young, yeah, yeah, young kids uh, uh, in the community who attend this eco club and when they finish their matric, then they don't have money to further their studies. Then they get opportunities in this. Some of them are food guide now. They are trackers through the, the eco club. So you, they give you small information, a little information where you they open your mind about the bush. And then after your matric, then you decide to go for this opportunity because in tourism there are so many characters, there are so many careers where you can choose which one you want to go for. Mm -hmm. So it must be really nice for you. It sounds like it's sort of gone full circle. You got that inspiration when you were in school, and now you're the one providing that for the younger generation. Yeah, yeah, it was so, it was so nice. 
And it was good for me to get it from an early age because now as we've got uh, the Bush Baby Project, I, I, I tell them about that. I tell them where I started. I started at school learning about this and here I am now working in the reserve. So I'm trying to, to, to invest in them and to also let them to know that they can start from an early age to be an animal guardian and then and, and they grow until where they want to be in life. So, and it's also good to start an, at an early age because we take information home. We tell our parents that we want to work in the reserve, we want to protect uh, the rhinos and, 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 and the, the elephant and, and lions. So by that, it will make uh, the poachers in the community to stop because they are they can see it obviously that when they continue killing, they are killing our 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 careers or our job or the next generation. Yeah, and, and the, the power of the education there, hopefully what you're teaching those children will help to influence the whole community like it did with you when you were younger. Um, that, that training sounded um, particularly difficult. What sort of skills, you said um, out in the field, you say you learn sort of combat skills, firearm skills? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've learned. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, you can come again with the question. I was just going, what were the sort of main skills you learned during the training? Okay, so the black members are unarmed uh, ladies, but through our training, because that is, that is part of the training, we did learn about firearm. But then we are unarmed. It's just that firearm was also part of the training, or people who are being trained, they go through it. But then we, we are coming to a project where we are unarmed. So uh, we have learned about um, animals' behavior. We have learned about tracking. We have learned how to sweep. We have learned how to patrol the boundaries. We have learned how to uh, how to how, how to kill the, the the poachers camp. And we have also learned how to gather information and also learn how to do roadblock, to search people, and to arrest people. And also the radio procedures of, uh, of a firearm, of a gunshot, the radio pr procedures of spores, you know, like uh, now you come across a spore of a porter and you want to, to report it. There are ways where you, you have to report it. So, um, yeah, we have, also learned, we have also learned about teamwork. We've learned about discipline. And then after that, when uh, when I have already I've already inside this project, uh, like already being a professional black mom, we have went uh, through a training of a uh, um, first aid kit because in the bush you you can get injured anytime. So it can happen. I'm with my my colleague and. Uh, whatever happens, she fall or whatever, and then we learn about the first aid kit, how to help each other, and we also learn about firearm, since there are so many roads and animals can run and start a fire, we also learn about how to stop it. So, yeah, there are so many things that we learn. <laughs> uh, so, is this part of um, one of the questions I was sick from a researcher um, picked up on was your broken window philosophy? Is that all part of that then? Um, yes, it's also part of that because, uh, you know, as you're in the bush, you come across an, uh, a rhino carcass. There are a few steps to follow and then and it also includes the community because the people who come inside and port are from the community. So, yeah, that's how it is. Great. Okay. Uh, this is... I think, um, I think I think I think uh, this is uh, this is exactly what she said earlier mm -hmm. about uh, closing the holes mm -hmm. and uh, basically doing the visual policing. Great likes to refer to uh, broken windows philosophy because uh, if I'm not mistaken that uh, the whole thing uh, originated somewhere in the United States uh, and basically what it entails is um, if we look after be it a building, be it a reserve, be it any other kind of uh, entity uh, and we look after it in a way that people from outside who intend to intrude uh, see that there is always presence, there is a consistent presence and people don't leave um, little crimes unnoticed, uh, eventually it will stop or it will be, it, it will not grow into something bigger. So uh, members in these regards, uh, they establish a strong presence on a 
uh, on, a, on a fence line. Uh, that is why they have to patrol day and night and uh, <clears throat> uh, close the holes, um, check for electricity on the fence, um, uh, constantly being there. And Craig also likes to call it Bobby's on the beat, but that's a, that's a, that's a <laughs> British thing, you must know that. <laughs> yes, uh, this is exactly what it entails, to, all, to let uh, the, uh, the people from outside know that uh, little crimes will also be prosecuted, that there is no way uh, the intrusion and any kind of signs of our uh, getting into the reserve will not be noticed. It will because uh, Mambas establish a strong presence in there. So just making it as difficult a place as possible for poachers to operate. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, the, the most important thing <clears throat> to remember here is that it's always easier to prevent the crime rather than dealing with the crime when yeah. it, it has already happened. Yeah. So that also relates to basically everything. Yeah, that's sort of the next bit I wanted to ask, because again, um, our researcher was asking if you're very active position being in the bush in the field if that changes your perspective on environmental issues and it sounds from what you were saying earlier later as if you don't see sort of the animals in the community as separate they're they're part of the same thing uh just wanted to double check uh, do you mean that um uh after being educated and exposed to the animals people don't really separate themselves from natural world is that yeah, they, they, they understand, you know, you're saying a lot of kids might not have seen the animals, um, okay. but through the work you're doing, they see why it's important, they understand a, bit, a little bit better. Uh, absolutely, 100%, because also, I think it, it again relates to um, any person globally, if you don't know uh, a lot or you don't know anything about something that has a value to those who do know about it. Uh, how can you um, relate to it? How can you uh, think a little bit in more in depth about that subject or uh, or matter? So, um, getting children and bush grannies uh, exposed to the animals and to environment as a whole, uh, it's it's a brilliant uh, way of first giving them opportunity to experience it <coughs> firsthand. Because uh, they don't just learn it in the, in the, in the, in the class, they uh, go to Kruger Park, they do different activities, they yeah, that, uh, see that animals, so interact with them. Yeah, they, they uh, smell the grass, smell the flowers, they uh, literally look at things, interact with with, with, a, with, a, uh, with animal or with an insect or uh, with a flower. And uh, when you uh, use all the senses that you have as a human being, uh, it's much more powerful than just a simple theory in a class. And especially if, you know, there's people from your own community doing that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, we have, um, last year, uh, the Bush Babies program hired six environmental monitors. So those environmental monitors also come from local communities. Um, and uh, this is part of the, our upliftment program as well. So black mamas coming from local communities and work uh, on the ground and working with children, explaining to them what anti-poaching is and why it is important. And six environmental monitors who actually do a brilliant job, besides the fact that they actually come to schools to teach the children about environment. Uh, they do the practicals for them, and then they go to uh, communities to work with the bush, babe, or bush grannies. Uh, they help them out in a household, yeah, carrying water, uh, cleaning their um, household from leaves or from, from anything. Uh, they help them growing their own vegetables. Uh, and also they uh, monitor um, different environmental issues within the community. Say, uh, there are lots of invasive plants uh, in South Africa. So uh, they go to the villages, they collect information, they uh, uh, submit the data through through, through a smartphone, um, and uh, uh, then that information goes further to, uh, I think it's K2C, by the yes. way, yes. Uh, through the Kenyan Biosphere, uh, our partners, um, and then from there, uh, well, we receive uh, basically instruction how to solve this issue out. Uh, it's not only about uh, alien vegetation, it's uh, sand mining, uh, it's um, water, it's pollution, plastic pollution, just literally everything. Wow. So it sounds, I think, you know, 
our students we teach them about things like poaching and they feel a little bit helpless so for you the real the real key here is adding that value for the local community exactly community work is, is crucial otherwise um we can't say about all the countries but in in, in south africa and in africa uh if there is no community work conservation is not sustainable really interesting i think you know, we want to know the solutions, but it sounds like you're definitely working on them. Um, I've seen recently, um, I've noticed coming up on my, my news feed, um, in Kenya, there's another group similar that set up a, an all-female anti-poaching unit. Is this something that you've, you've seen growing? And do you think the all-female aspect of it, um, what do you think that really adds that might make it more attractive to make it grow? Uh, is it Kenya or is it Zimbabwe? Uh, I've seen one in Kenya, they're, they're, I've, that's the only one I've seen, there might be other ones, I'm sure there are other ones elsewhere. Uh, yeah, because we are aware there are two female anti-poaching uh, units in um, fur further north uh, in southern Africa. Um, one of them is a Kashinga in uh, Zimbabwe, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Uh, then another one was established last year uh, by uh, Craig's colleague. Uh, I don't remember the name of the park. It has this um, very long African name, uh, but it's on the border between, it, it's somewhere in the Victoria Falls area. So it's a new new unit. Uh, they started functioning only last year. Uh, but uh, there is a tendency in Africa, um, on the African continent, uh, to uh, launch more and more female anti poaching and wildlife security units. Yeah, um, black mouse were the first, so as later mentioned earlier, uh, the first team started operating in 2013, uh, second uh, intake was in 2014. Uh, then Akashinga, I think they were, they started working in 2015, two years after you. Yeah, two, three, yeah. and that this new one uh, only last year, so there is a tendency and it's a good sign. Uh, there is a good reason for that and uh, also we we think the val we, we see the value in women as breadwinners and as a change makers in the community as well, enhance conservation. Uh, because um, I think you, you related to that a little bit earlier in our conversation. Um, women cannot allow themselves to just say go and get drunk when there is a problem in mm -hmm. the community. Uh, in South African communities, a woman um, is a primary caregiver. So because a woman in South African community has already these qualities in herself, uh, it's, it's impossible. If she loses the job, she can't just you know, get drunk and say and give the uh, security information away. It, it will never happen. So that resilience and strength of a woman um, made us think, okay, so those qualities are applicable uh, to conservation as well and security work as well. And any time in the future or if, if you, if you uh, happen to meet them and if you happen to meet Craig and talk to him, uh, this is something that he emphasizes all the time. He believes in a women's women's character and women's qualities are uh, to to you know not only carry a child within but but to carry the values to carry um uh that caring and nurturing attitude towards not only human beings but towards nature as well so so far uh, it seems to be um the concept that uh, has become quite I wouldn't say popular, but um, uh, people in Southern Africa and other mm. countries and reserves f find it quite um, um, interesting and uh, something that uh, they see value in. And yeah, definitely we starting to spread. We are really happy to know it. I mean, that's, that's really interesting because one of the questions I was asked was whether the role of women in Southern Africa made it more difficult for you doing this job, but it sounds like actually you would say it makes them almost more suitable. Uh, you see, yeah, there are two sides. So uh, from from our thing, you can confirm from from South African communities, from African communities, 
you are suitable for this role, but what it makes it difficult uh, on current landscape is to try and fit or try and um, change the mindset of um, local, I would say, white people from old schools conservation and old mm -hmm. traditional and searching uh, uh, units ideas. So we, this is what makes it difficult because uh, <laughs> this is the first uh, female unarmed anti-poaching unit. And it's really, really difficult to communicate uh, this idea why uh, an armed unit can be as successful as armed unit. And recent events, I think that was in Kenya uh, this year, earlier this year, uh, just shows us that the guns are not a solution anymore. Poaching still happens when rangers carry the guns. And the guns are, do not protect you from being killed. Those yeah, rangers that were killed, thirteen year rangers. Yeah, they're just making it worse. Yeah, so we're not saying that it's bad for people to use guns. It's no, it's not much for them. Yeah. And then we're speaking our own language. Yeah, exactly. Because if you are in the bush and you've got a gun, you, you know when a lion attack you, let's say you find yourself in the middle of lions because they can hide. Yeah, you will think I've got a gun and you protect me, and then you're ready to to fight with it. So if the lion attack you, you will shoot. By happen you shoot and you miss. And if you shoot and miss or you shoot and hit the leg, when the lion comes to you, it's now angry because that thing is in pain. So when yeah. it comes to you, it is coming to kill. So, but when you are unarmed, you, you think twice, what do I do here? You are more careful. You know, is there yeah. something that I can do? Mm -hmm. yeah. Unlike holding a gun. Sometimes when you, you, when the poachers see you, like so many people used to ask, how do we do it without weapons while the poachers mm -hmm. come inside the reserve? And um, some rangers has been killed or some rangers has killed the poachers. With us, you know, poachers are scared. They don't want to be seen. They know mm -hmm. they will be there will be consequences. They're going to go to, to jail and it might happen. They don't get a job anymore because their finger yeah. are there. And then they, those people don't want to be seen. They make sure that they hide. They don't want people to see, to see them. Mm -hmm. So if we see them first, we, we, we hide and report them. And those people are going to run for their life. They're going to run away from the reserve. They don't want to be reported. They don't want to be seen. So when you've got weapons and they see that you've got weapons, they think, okay, so now... We have to fight. Mm. We'll see who's gonna yeah. kill them. Yeah. You know, so yeah, they they're going to fight. But with us, they know we we are not. Yeah. Why should they attack us with weapons? So I think this is one of the things that make 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 us survive because they know we're not fighting with the bullies. But yeah. we are chasing them out of the reserve so that they can go outside and commit another crimes like uh, bombing the ATM and steal money. And then the police are going to make sure that they will run against it, then we are out of that thing. Because, you know, in South Africa, when when you find a poacher inside, it takes a long time. You, so, you, you know, you waste so many time going to court, so many money, so many time to talk, while there are something that you should be doing inside the reserve. Yeah. And also, I just wanted to clarify <clears throat> uh, one moment. Uh, of course, we do not say that to commit another crime is, is an option. It's absolutely not... Uh, uh, what what, what Lita, I think wanted to say. Yeah, uh, but, but your job uh, is to prevent crime, poaching. Crime is a crime, right? Crime is a crime. And uh, if, say, we prevent the poachers from, if the Black Mamas prevent the poachers from coming into the reserve, in the first place, they do not need to chase them out when they're already there. Uh, oh. And if they're pushed away, if poaching is not a uh, the solution for them to get money, they will find a different way to get money. So basically, this is what Leto was saying. So if, yeah. if you start poaching, it's, it's going to be something else. But it's easier in a, in a more populated area and, say, in a bigger town or a bigger city to be detected and be caught. Uh, so that prosecution so is easier. Yeah, exactly. So it sounds like sort of without the last resort of that gun, your focus then becomes more on preventing, and that's actually more effective. This is more effective. Preventing is more more effective at all times. Exactly. That's interesting. I, I don't think many people would have taken that approach to it. So, has it worked for you? Have you seen a reduction in poaching? 
Yes, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does work for us. Um, there are so many stories that happen. So many stories. We've come across poachers so many times. We've come across animals where we nearly got killed, but still we we survived. So yeah, it is working for us. I think in the past, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me. Um, you you assisted with six arrests. Yes, so six arrests. yes there is one wow. arrest that we assist was you know uh Balure is in, uh, a neighborhood of Fosco mine mm-hmm. so people pass poachers pass by Balure to go and steal copper in the mine mm-hmm. so you know they still mm-hmm. come inside the reserve mm-hmm. to to go to to steal copper yeah. and then they will come back through the reserve again mm-hmm. and when they pass by the reserve they can see right mm-hmm. and those these people are capable of stealing then they can take the information and give it to the right people who mm-hmm. got weapons who can come and yeah. kill the poachers. So we also uh, arrest those people who go to the mine to steal copper and pass by the mm-hmm. reserve because that is like uh, they, they're still going to give information away. Yeah. So yeah, uh, there are so many, so many arrests that we've done. We've done. I remember last time I was chased by poachers in 2015. Mm. Oh damn! It was difficult. Oh, the time, you know, the time where this thing was happening, I was like, I told myself that if I survive here, I am packing my bags tonight. I'm going home because you know we 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 went to sweep and we saw um we we spotted uh two buffaloes that has been killed by a snake, mm-hmm. and then we were hundred percent sure that those people are gonna come back tonight to get the meat, mm-hmm. and really that happened. Those people came back. So we decided to go and do ambush. It was around six. It was uh, me, Kateko Cute, and Johan with other two guys. And then they were armed. But then those who were armed said they're going to hide near the, 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 the buffaloes. And then we're going to hide at the bridge where the people would pass by. And then we'll give information to the people who are hiding that they are calm. So while we're hiding there, we heard a sound of a car coming. And we, we know the sound of all our cars. I can tell who's coming now. We, which car is coming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that car was like, no, 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 this is not one of us. This is not one of us and then we hide. So when we hide, that white buggy passed by and it took the right direction. And you know what? Pontus at Lever people are professional people. Mm-hmm. They even took a uh, red, uh, um, you know, red, red, no, what can I say, a red wool, mm-hmm. and then they tie it with the branches to, to give those people, mm-hmm. to, to mm-hmm. alert those people that if you see the red uh, mm-hmm. wool, that is the right direction, mm-hmm. keep going. And then those mm-hmm. people decide, yeah, they just decided to say, I know this is the wrong direction. And they came straight to where we were hiding. And I think we were just uh, 10 meters away from each other. Okay. And they bright the, 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 the lights of the car. They could definitely see us and we were looking at each other. Like, what's going to happen now? Myself, knowing that from the two girls that I was with, I am the, the bad one and running. So I told them, guys, now we have to run. And I was in the front. I jumped first and I ran. Then they followed me. I remember I was holding a bottle of water. And I was holding an apple. It felt like I was holding two bricks. Mm-hmm. And it was too much. And I can't more. And the other girls, I was the first one to jump and run. Mm-hmm. And then they came and passed me. <laughs> like when Kandemo was holding a radio phone. She mm-hmm. just pressed the radio phone. Everybody could hear that the way she's breathing, she is running. And because she's running, she can't, her ways are not going to be mm-hmm. clear. But she managed to, 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 to let uh, she also know yeah. that we are being chased by poachers. There was no other way we could do that yeah. than to run for our life. Yeah. So those people, they came after us. They jumped off the car and started to chase us. I think they realized that, no, these are girls. Mm. And then they chased us. When they chased us, we ran. I looked back. You know, it was full moon. Full moon. I looked back and I found that, oh, those people are coming. And I shouted to them that the people are coming. And I decided that, you know what, the torture and whatever that they're going to do to us, I don't want to face it. I know there is the fence got electricity, but today I'm touching the fence. It's either oh, I can wow. jump today. Mm-hmm. Luckily, that was the time of the Amarulas, and the elephants loved Amarula a lot. Mm-hmm. 
So they always want to go outside the reserve because the Amarolas on the fence line are fresh because the trees are not being attacked every now and then by elephants. Mm. So one of the elephants pushed down the fence to go and eat the Amarola. So the electricity was not working. Mm. And then I touched the fence like, oh, there's no electricity. And I shouted to them to jump mm. inside. And then we wow. jumped and hide those people. Yeah, you know, <laughs> so yeah, those people, we even had them running and talking, where are they, where are they, we can't see them anymore. Because it was full moon, you could clearly see everything. And then they turned back to fetch the car, and they were driving up, up and down. Mm. So luckily they realized that these people, now they're hiding. Maybe they have reported, we are still busy chasing them, somebody will come and find us here. So they decided to run away. Mm. So luckily we, 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 we saw the car and a bit of a number plate and it was three men with mm. three girls and then they ran away. So uh, Johan came and assist us. So it was, you know, this thing just happened fast, fast. And luckily mm. Johan arrived fast also to come and assist us. So we, we survived and after that, these are the stories that we need to tell to our grandchild. You know, when I'm older, we'll be sitting down with them in a fire, telling them that when I was uh, 21 years old, I was waking there and I was doing this thing and this is what happened. I will tell them all the stories of the animals. It will be a different story to what I had from my grannies because they will tell us that, you know, a lion is going to kill you. Mm. And an elephant is going to kill you. So I'm going to tell them that, you know what, if you can just grow uh, love and bond with the, uh, with the animals and give them space, you will feel the love. I'm like telling them that, you know what, at 21, I was so strong with an AK. I was, I shot so many photos and like, you know. This is not what children would like to hear. You know, yeah. This yeah. is not something that I want to tell my kid. Mm. That I was working in Baluda and I killed so many photos, you know, it's, it's just bad. I will tell them nice stories, you know, we were preventing animals from yeah. being caught. You know, today, there is a rhino because I risked my life. I went and patrolled the fence line and protect the rhino. So uh, this is what we want to give mm. back to the community. And to yeah. Our yeah, what an, what an inspiration they'll have. Um, have you ever found <laughs> anybody involved with poaching who was part of your sort of local community? Actually, it's not, uh, it's, it's not easy to point, in, especially in the communities, that this one is a poacher without a uh, solid evidence. Mm -hmm. You can just suspect that uh, but this person is not working, or this person has never ever worked, mm -hmm. or he doesn't have a business, mm -hmm. but why is he having all this sort of thing that is happening out of the blue, just having so much money in in, in just a minute. Mm -hmm. So you can just suspect that they might be involved with rhino coaching. Mm -hmm. And then um, the only thing that you can point is like when you find somebody in the bush mm -hmm. with the firearm, with the rhino. Because still in South African law, you can find somebody in the reserve with a firearm and they will charge them of trespassing. Mm -hmm. Then it's easier when you find them with a firearm and a rhino hole. And then, then you are sure mm. that you've got an evidence that yeah. is a rhino poacher. But you've got a house. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to apologise because I think the screen has frozen. I thought it might sort itself out, but it doesn't appear to us. So you've been frozen for a little bit, but it's fine. We, we can still hear you fine. It's um, <laughs> I don't want to keep you too much long because you've given us so much of your time. Uh, but Valeria, could you tell us a little bit more about what you do in the, in the organisation? Uh, yes, uh, I will happily do that. Uh, so currently, um, I'm working as a media liaison, uh, and I do some other things uh, due to the fact that uh, in our company we're a small NGO and uh, several people have several responsibilities. So um, I manage social, social media, our websites are uh, currently under construction. Um, then I help uh, create a little bit with funding right now, so I just deal with funders, who future sponsors. Uh, and last year we started um, working with on merchandise. We haven't really had uh, proper merchandise before, so we're trying to find ways how to do um, Black Mama merchandise so that we can actually uh, sustain our company ourselves uh, without relying too much on extra funding. So basically that's my role. Um, I really like to go to the field sometimes when I can. 
uh, because I also enrolled myself into a nature conservation course just to um, uh, teach myself more about the industry that I'm working in. Uh, and it's, it's nice to uh, get this extra knowledge to also to write better about uh, what we're doing here um, and have some practical experience. But currently uh, what I'm doing uh, takes all my time, so not really too much time to do the field work, but every time I have to, uh, uh, the opportunity to do that, I just uh, take it all the time. Yeah, but uh, I didn't really uh, come from any natural science background. Uh, I started uh, um, from art history <laughs> in St. Petersburg of, um, University. Yeah, we'll need to know the, know the whole story. Uh, then this all happened. Uh, yeah, I went to the UK uh, to study anthropology, but uh, even in my art history course, I never really was interested in um, European art history. All my projects were about um, uh, indigenous people of the world. Uh, which is Australian Aboriginal people, people in Africa, uh, and uh, Indians of North and South America. And in the UK, um, my project was about South Africa. Uh, I enjoyed my course immensely, but one trip to British Museum, uh, where we saw uh, different beautifully carved items, uh, carved from elephant ivory, mm. made me think. And what it made me think about is, are we still doing it? And that thought in that particular day, in that particular place, changed my life completely. This is where I decided I'm, I'm, I don't think I belong to anthropology and academia that much. Uh, something started to pull me back to Africa and figure out, is there anything that I personally can do to stop this? And uh, back then, when I managed to come back to South Africa, I uh, worked in different places uh, that actually helped me to find people, uh, the right people who were already working in conservation or in tourism. Uh, and through them, I managed to find people who knew Craig. I came for the interview, and this is how basically things started to happen. So nothing, nothing is in vain. Uh, the journey can be quite long for for any person. Uh, whether you you are passionate conservationist since the day one of your birth, <laughs> uh, or you have to go through several stages and different. Uh, careers um, and eventually you, you realize where you belong or where exactly you want to make a difference uh, and both ways are fine. So yeah as you said I think there's some really important lessons there actually for anybody whether they want a career in the environment or whether they know exactly what they want to do or even if they're sat there now you know a lot of our students will be finishing their GCSEs their A levels they might not know what they want to do you came to this sector quite late. Um, well, uh, I think maybe most of the people will say that it's quite late. Uh, but given that I ha I've had uh, a lot of different other backgrounds and experiences, mm -hmm. um, I just think it's just the right time for me. Uh, it could be late for other people, but it's the right time for me. Um, yeah, but if, if, on, if you said... I would appreciate that. If someone had told you when you were 18 finishing your A-levels that you'd end up working in South Africa with the Black Mambas, would, would that have been something you'd have expected then? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> I had a so that, that's what I mean by you came to it quite late. You got quite far along the line of doing your degree, doing your master's, and even after that point, you were still able to change and follow your interests. There was nothing set about what you were doing. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I think as uh, I think I mentioned somewhere before, uh, to be involved with nature conservation and just to work in the industry, uh, a student or just a person, is, you, you don't really need to study nature conservation, you don't really need to be a biologist, you don't really need to get all those uh, relevant degrees. Uh, nature conservation industry um, employs people from absolutely different walks of life. Uh, just like any other company anywhere in the world, conservation NGO needs accountants. 
Uh, it needs people who do the fundraising. It needs people who uh, can uh, look and cure animals, which is well, veterinarians, basically. Uh, it needs people or veterinary nurses. Uh, it needs people who... Uh, it needs drivers. Uh, it needs um, maintenance people. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's such a uh, big industry and a different skill set um, is not worse than another skill set. You see, we, they're all equal and equally applicable and equally valuable to the conservation. So uh, students who just start their career path and think about uh, going uh, that direction, they shouldn't, they shouldn't really worry at the very beginning uh, how uh, things will play out. Like for me personally, um, I had to go through different works and jobs and employments which I didn't like, uh, but I had to do that because I kept that idea in my head. I, I, I want to be there, but what must I go through in order to be there? If, even if it's in a year's time or in a five years time, it doesn't matter. Uh, so each step you take eventually leads you to your goal. And that is really important to remember. Um, so, I mean, this is a question to, to both of you then. What do you think are sort of the important skills or qualities somebody should work on? You know, you, you've touched on there having the specific degree or being directly in nature conservation isn't necessarily the important thing. So what do you think are sort of the skills and qualities people should, should work on, should look for in themselves if this is something they're interested in? Uh, well, I would think that uh, it depends on which country a person is coming from, but the language, the language, if you want to work in South African conservation industry, the majority of people here are speaking, are they are speaking English. So if there's something that, you know, you have to work on, you have to work on. Like uh, English is widely spoken in South Africa. Even people from local communities, most of them also okay. speak. Yeah, they, they, they learn English at school, so they, they speak English. Um, in South Africa in particular, it's Afrikaans as well, but even Afrikaans people, they uh, speak English because it's just a dominant language, so to speak. So lots of uh, scientific literature is written in, uh, in, in English language. Lots of, uh, even some channels in South Africa, TV channels, they mm -hmm. do, uh, they translate um, yeah, conservation programs and the wildlife programs in English as well, just so that more, yeah. more people could, could understand, yeah. Um, then also, um, just a genuine interest in wildlife and uh, animals and uh, uh, genuine heart for, 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 for this industry. Even if you don't de develop this um, quality or feeling for the nature early on, uh, it still can happen later on in your life. That's, uh, that, that is such a common thing. Um, and also, I think it's very important for any human being to develop soft skills as well. Uh, because even though we work to protect animals and plants and uh, insects and other other living beings, we still work with people. We still work with people, and we work with people from different backgrounds, different nationalities, uh, different mindsets. Our uh, conservation is pretty much of an international kind of uh, industry, uh, so it's really important to. Uh, be open-minded and um, uh, adaptable in many ways, and uh, being being willing to accommodate people of a uh, different different culture or different uh, different way of thinking. Uh, yeah, but you know, I, what I've noticed is when you are already in here and you start communicating, working, uh, engaging, it's actually getting easier. It gets easier. Uh, might sound difficult when you're outside, when you're just a planet, but as soon as you get inside and you uh, start experiencing all this kind of thing, it's actually getting easier. It's, it's yeah, that's, that's, that's something I was thinking from what you said earlier. Once you've got into that career, you've then got the options and the training, and it's just getting that first foot in the door. Exactly. And also, I think what is also important for, for younger people and students to know that um, they don't need to define exactly uh, when they start what exactly in conservation they want to do. When you, when you are exposed to the industry and you start trying different things, this is how you develop a natural feel where, where, where you need to go and what, what uh, skills you develop faster, 
uh, what you have to work on. Uh, it's it comes natural. There's really nothing really to stress about, to worry about. It will come naturally when you when you start. So that's fine. That's brilliant. Really useful. I mean, my last question was going to be, what advice would you have for young people? But I think you've you've given so much there that. People are going to find all of that useful. Um, so the last thing that people wanted to know, I suppose, because um, I've kept you for an awfully long time, much longer than I expected, but it's been so interesting. Um, what can people here do to support you and your work? Uh, we accept any kind of work, any kind of help. It's um, we don't expect anything from our. Uh, People, especially now, because uh, we're aware that globally uh, during the lockdown, uh, people have been struggling with their income, with um, with many other things. So we do not really expect anything, but uh, um, we can only refer people to our website uh, in a particular section, support us, and then in support us, you will see lots of different options. It's fundraising. Uh, people can donate money. Again, any amount is welcome because we do understand that everybody is going through a difficult time right now uh, but also from our side even little bit matters so more than welcome to have a look at that page and also spreading awareness it's, it's very important it's uh, um, it's probably one of the most important things the more people uh, know and uh, talk about it and um, research and do presentations or maybe some projects as calls uh, that helps a lot because that, that is basically um, our um, one of our goals to spread awareness and to educate other people, be it South Africa, Africa, or globally. Brilliant. You give me a few ideas for our Eco Club when we get back. Uh, I've got some ways to keep them busy now. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for your time. Um, I, I think we've got absolutely everything we were hoping for and much more. So thank you very, very much, especially on your birthday. Um, it's been really interesting. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. If there are any, yeah. if there are any other questions uh, from, from your students or from, uh, from the professors or educators, you're more than welcome to submit it to uh, media at transfrontierafrica.co.uk but I can send you the email as well. Unfortunately, I can't do it through my phone right now, but we'll, we'll be more than happy to, to answer. Brilliant. I'll um, attach the link to your supporters page um, and your Facebook groups as well so people can have a look at those. And if there's any more questions, I can, I can pass them on. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, ladies. So Thank, Thank, Thank you, Nathan. Thank you for the time. Yeah. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Have a good day for that.